Greetings for everyone. It's a pleasure to be once again part of the South South Forum on Sustainability, specifically in this eighth edition. In this lecture today, it's focusing on Buen Vivir, Good Living, and the process of hope in Latin America. We're reaching this lecture after several years working together. We met Kinchi and Jade years ago in one of the seminars of uh, Dilemmas of Humanity in the Florestan Fernandez School in Brazil. Since then, we've been participating as ALBA movements and Venezuelan Institute in the South-South forums. And since then, we've continued participating in the forum. Last year and during this year, we've organized online webinars on Venezuela and its struggles. So Venezuela from a different perspective. And today we reached this forum where we want to see the small, we want to go over some of the processes that despite the media, mainstream media campaign that wants to remove visibility from the processes of change in Latin America, we've been able to see processes of struggle and mobilization in Peru. This continues also in Colombia during the States. We've been able to analyze how since 2019, the Bolivian people were able to conquer over a coup d'etat. We saw how Venezuela and Cuba continue resisting despite the blockades. And we can also see how Chile continues fighting in a process, in a constituency process and the possibilities of a political change in that country. Latin America is in the movement. They've defeated ALCA more than 20 years ago. And from then on, we have a process of struggle to focus on the peoples, different processes that focus on, on the peoples. Today's event, we'll go over different experiences. We'll be first going into with Laura Capote, a more regional uh, perspective with Javier Calderon, the specific Colombian conjuncture and with uh, Professor Hector Bejar, he's not with us yet. We hope he can join soon. He will tell us about Peru. And with Professor Fernando Wanacuni, we'll go into the mobilization process in Bolivia and the alternatives that are presented here. So without further ado and with, to get started, uh, Professor Wanacuni asked us to give him the possibility to be the first since he's right now in his Sunday uh, children's Kung Fu lesson right in the middle. So we are going to give Fernando this opportunity. So let me just share a few comments on our comrade Fernando. He is former minister of foreign affairs of the plurinational state of Bolivia. During uh, 2019 and 2018, he was part of this administration. He was born on May 29th, 1966. He is a son of the Aymara nation. He is a lawyer, a profession, university professor and researcher of the ancestral cosmovision and history of the original indigenous peoples. He is author of the book, Vivir Bien, Buen Vivir, Good Living, Living Well, Philosophies, Politics, Strategies and Experiences of Ancestral Peoples. This is a book that we also shared as one of the references the bibliography for this invitation. We hope it can then be available in other languages. So far, it's available only in Spanish. And so I give the floor to our dear brother, Fernando Wanacuni. Go ahead, Fernando. Good morning, everyone, brothers and sisters who are joining us today in this day. Very special greetings from Bolivia. We are above 3,600 meters above sea level. So it's a very high uh, position this city is in, just to share as we continue on with our reflections. Latin America, the continent, as well as the world, are going through a very transcendental moment for the processes that we call processes of change, transformation. They mean precisely to shift, to change from one pardon or logic to another pardon or logic. Capitalism, with its homogenizing hegemonic system, has sustained a form of production that meant the destruction of life, the destruction of peoples, spoilage of peoples, and destroying Mother Earth. Capitalism and the modern world promote living better, 
living better means a uh, perspective of human being as simply consumers someone who consumes and who needs to be sold more and more products products that are created by destroying mother earth destroying forests mountains and contaminating rivers living better is a modern way or method that presents a disposable form of life that simply uses and abuses human beings, modern human beings who are today living in this capitalist structure. This makes it impossible for human beings to live free. They are constantly bombarded with uh, by uh, mainstream media and social media for them to consume more and more, to buy things. And when they buy more and consume more, as we know, modern human beings are also contributing to the destruction of Mother Earth. Capitalism is a, a system of depredation. It's a system that goes against Mother Earth. And so the original indigenous people of the continent and worldwide, because there, there is an underlying natural logic that they have promoted since the beginning of times. This is living well or good living this is very different to living better this is a system that attempts to achieve harmony the human being being in harmony with everyone with their partners with their family with society with father cosmos and mother earth and living well something essential and fundamental is mother earth pachamama and if we do not care for pachamama we are destroying the matrix of life capitalism as it produces by destroying is affecting the fundamental matrix of life pachamama and if the if it destroys pachamama it destroys and affects the balance of every form of life in living well what is essential is taking care of this relation human being by taking care of Pachamama through harmony and balance, taking care of this sacred relation, the source and matrix of life, Mother Earth, Pachamama. Our brother, Evo Morales, said very well that we cannot live without Mother Earth, but the Mother Earth can live without us. So here's an essential issue, a central issue that our generation needs to reflect upon. That's why. The processes of change have to do with going from an individualistic logic to a communal or community logic, going beyond even the social logic. Let's remember that in revolutionary processes, the historic revolutionary processes, there's a definition of social consciousness as being sensitive or empathetic with all human beings. But as original indigenous people, we go beyond social awareness because this struggles and fights only in the defense of human beings but a communal consciousness fights yes for the people but also for life for mountains for rivers for trees so it goes beyond simply a social struggle this is something essential that the process of change in the continent and worldwide need to keep in mind because if we struggle only for human beings we are forgetting something that indigenous original people called Pacha, the beginning of life. Human being isn't just itself, it's also life. The vision of indigenous people isn't simply anthropocentric, that's the modern vision. Capitalist vision is a sexist, anthropocentric vision, which is destroying life right now. On the other hand, for us, for indigenous people, it's life beyond simply or only human being. At the center of everything, we have life. And in this process, we need to also start defining our project in terms of our proposals for change. In that sense, we have shifted. We've proposed to migrate. The process of change is to migrate from one logic to another. The colonial Republican project of nation state has not responded and will not respond because it is uh, an individual anthropocentric project. That's why we, that is why we are migrating and proposing a plurinational project, which has a component of acknowledging diversity and acknowledging that life has multiple expression. That's why the nation state is in itself 
failed in its confirmation itself. That's why we need to migrate into plurinational projects. Ecuador and Bolivia in year 2008, 2009, migrated already to plurinational structures. This has allowed us to live behind an individualist consumption-based predator consciousness. However, with the horizon of living well, we think about taking care of Pachamama, taking care of life, which of course means a complete change of capitalist hegemonic colonial structure because a capitalist system is not the answer. It's not that because we consume more or have more that we are happier or life is better. Capitalism is leading us towards an abyss. It's dangerous for everyone. As such, our generation has a great question that it needs to deal with right now. A question that it needs to answer. Will we continue on, on this horizon, on this path of approaching an abyss in the structure of capitalism? As indigenous people, we say absolutely not. That is why, once again, the road of living well or good living, taking care of Pachamama, the proposal of the plurinational state is based on an anti-colonialist, anti-capitalist process. In this process, it is in this process that we're working on. It's not just a struggle against the hegemony of capital, it's also a struggle for life. Because if we continue in this predator system, Mother Earth is very much affected and as such life as a whole. Good living or living well means recovering our balance. It highlights identity, who we are and where we come from and where, where we are headed. So what is the role of our generation and what is the horizon of life? As such, these essential questions in good living and living well begin with the recuperation or reconstitution of cultural identity. Cultural identity is created with a, in a re loving relationship with the environment, which will provide us with a perspective of different life. So when we say process of change, because now the continent is in a process of change, this means it will shift from this logic, this predator capitalist uh, structure logic to a culture of life. And for that, what we propose is a plurinational America. That means that the continent recovers its original historic structure of Abiyayala, the spirit in construction, not only social, but communal in a relationship of caring for life. That is definitely to migrate out of and to live capitalist structure. As such, community structure, the structure of life, will define in a different way the configuration, the responsibility and accountability of future gener generations. And in this sense, in this context, nowadays, living well or good living, this is two terms that are entrenched from Patagonia to Alaska. We are right now reflecting about recovering this natural way of life in a process of the historic struggle of peoples. We don't only resist, we have a proposal. This proposal is plurinational, plurinational living well and good living. And now to close, we were reflecting on the Monroe Doctrine and the perspective of hegemony. They said, America for the Americans. But that was uh, an outlook that considered the United States as the owners of everything that had to do with Latin America and the historic response of social movements and unions. They had a very strong response here. Latin America is not the US, the United States backyard. But today, current generations are proposing in order to have our own principle and our own uh, horizon of struggle is to rebuild and promote plurinational America. That means to recover this natural co communal path and to bring together something 
essential that hopefully we can also think about in this very dialogue to bring together social movements, social organizations, unions, women's organizations, youth organizations with original indigenous people's organizations. If we bring together these two forces, a struggle of the indigenous people that has 500 years of history with the with the struggles of miners and workers and students, this will be historic. The process of change is imminent. It's a one way road. As such, it cannot be contained. That is why it is very important that this struggle is historic in this very generation that we are in. That's why we say very, very determinedly that living well, good living is our path, it's our horizon within the structure we are in. We're all, all of us are heirs because I have gone through, I've traveled to different continents in Asia, Africa, Europe, West and East Europe. I've gone through different places and I've found that ancestral cultures created a relationship always with their environments. And it is that which we call living well and good living. This relationship of respect in which you produce without destroying. You produce by taking care of harmony and balance. That is why living well and good living is a natural process of building a relationship with Mother Earth. That's what we need to go back to. This is the best moment to do it. So we hope that in this reflection, um, following this perspective, that we may be able to consolidate, to explain and to continue moving forward. As someone said, after the battles of weapons come the greatest battle, the battle of ideas the battle of thoughts, of structures and logics. We are right now in a process of change. The whole continent is moving. And as such, the proposal of our ancestors cannot be contained. Thank you very much and greetings to all of the peoples. Thank you very much, Fernando, for that statement. I think it's key to uh, highlight something that I'm not sure if got confused uh, within the interpretation process, but in America, in Latin America, good living and living well are completely different ways of life to living better, as we define the American way of life. The type of living defined by capitalism is completely different to the way of living defined by our peoples and the peasantry which is living in harmony with everything. So I'd like to highlight uh, what Fernando said and confirm the importance of seeking this alternative way, alternative mode of living, uh, alternative mode of living to the one proposed by capitalism and that's colonial and racist. So we're really focusing on the alternative proposal for building a mode of living that's in harmony with nature, a communitarian, a community way of living. And the proposal is to integrate all of Latin America with all of our diverse peoples and nations and find this new alternative way of living on our continent. So thank you very much, Fernando. Fernando, if you'd like to continue with your class, what we'd ask is that once you're done with your class, if you could connect again uh, to join in with the question and answer session. So now I'll give the floor to our dear comrade, Laura, Laura Capote, and I'll just uh, say a few words about our great sister in struggle, Laura. She is a Colombian journalist. She graduated from the University of Buenos Aires. She got her master's in international relations at the National University of La Plata. She is responsible for political education at the Secretariat of Alba Movimientos. She is also a member of the Observatorio de Coyuntura de América Latina y el Caribe, the OBSAL, or the Observatory on the Latin Americas and Caribbean Conjuncture of the Tricontinental Institute. And she's also a member of the Working Group on Colum Colombian Crit Critical Thinking. So I'd like to welcome Laura 
and she will give us a general overview of the situation on the continent. Welcome, Laura. Hi, Annan. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on which part of the world you're in. Well, Hernan, I think that um, after some of the things that Hernan has, as Fernando said to us, I think it would be good, uh, as you say, to contextualize uh, everything, because of course, in this forum, we have people from all over the world, and perhaps the Latin American situation is something that's really dynamic, very moving, and we say we are never bored. Everything happens here, but we're never bored because perhaps we'll wake up one day, one Sunday, for example, and finally we uh, we finally read the news that finally the candidate that we've been supporting for months has finally been voted in as president, as was the case, for example, in Peru with Pedro Castillo. So that's just an example of what can happen on a daily basis in our continent. So as uh, Ananda was saying that we have different movements and what we do as part of my organization we analyze the different movements across the continent but we also focus on the reality of the peoples and the different social movements and we look at the background as well of what's going on behind this for example the economic situation the social situation of each country but we also look at what common elements there are between the different countries beyond the specific particular uh, issues. And so we try and get a broad overview. And we also try and pick out the diff different, particularly important issues of recent moments. And so we start to think perhaps since the pandemic, how different movements and forces have been building up across the continent. So I, what I would like to point out is that this moment that we're living through in Latin America and the Caribbean is like a second or advance or a reactivization of a movement that start, began in our continent at the beginning of the 20th century uh, with the arrival of Hugo Chavez to the presidency of Venezuela and how the continental situation has been developing and the effect of this can still be seen today. We often say that Venezuela and Cuba are the big brothers that open the door to the rest of us and allow us to have other projects, as Hernan and Fernando were saying, other projects that are different to capitalism, a clear political horizon uh, or panorama with a clear dream and clear objective. Um, a clear panorama with, panorama with other characteristics and in our continent that we have set out as a continent in conflict, which is a very common sentiment in Latin America and the Caribbean, and that is that our continent is in conflict. Although from the people's perspective on, uh, in our continent, we haven't won, but neither has capitalism. Social movements haven't won, neither has capitalism. No one has had a complete victory on our continent. So we are in a conflict and this is the conflict we're in at the moment. So we've been living through this ever since 2013, 2014, and we've been going back to neoliberal conservative projects and from some countries having advanced with more socialist, uh, populist projects without saying that they're majorly anti-capitalist. But yes, what we have been seeing is some improvements. Of course, there are some exceptions in the cases of Venezuela, Cuba and Nicaragua. But in the rest of the continent, we have been seeing an advance of these progressive movements where the working class have acquired more rights and have got more possibilities to build this decent life. And so since 2013, 2014, what we saw was a return to these neoliberal conservative movements. This because of errors committed by 
uh, these socialist populist movements. So we always, of course, need to be self-critical, but what we got was a new era as well of a North American imperialism and this idea that they wanted to dominate the fate of America and trying to find new ways of impacting these progressive movements, all of which had been built underneath a strong feeling of national sovereignty. And this at some point was grouped around a movement against free trade. So what uh, the expression we use often in Spanish is that the, the US thinks of us as their backyard from where to extract na primary resources, natural resources, uh, labor. But our continent is a very rich continent in terms of natural resources. It's a very diverse continent and imperialism, of course, knows that. So imperialism found different ways of interfering with these socialist and populist movements. And so they found new indirect ways of interfering in the reality of our countries, as is like the example, the very famous example in our countries, which is the Laufer case. Well, Javier is an expert in this, but this legal war showed us how through the United States intervention and the ruling classes of our countries, how they use and weaponize the whole legal apparatus and the judges to build new cases and invent new crimes that these left-wing and progressive leaders had supposedly committed. And from these fake legal processes, they managed to imprison these leaders, as happened in Ecuador, as happened obviously in Brazil. And that's where it was most clear where they managed to impeach a, a president, as was the case of Dilma Rousseff. So now we're seeing that there are new ways of intervening in political terms. But in 2019, we're seeing that it's not just new ways, but also we're seeing the old ways of intervening, as we saw in November 2019 in Bolivia, where there was a clear coup d'etat. And now, over a year later, with the investigations that the government is carrying out using uh, the legal apparatus in Bolivia, we're seeing that these, this coup was not only supported and financed by the United States and international organizations such as the OAS, which had a real important role in supporting this coup d'etat and this de facto government of Yanina of Yanez, but the right-wing governments, which were able to conquer the ruling classes in our countries in this period, were all, was also very important. For example, uh, the case of Lenin Moreno in Ecuador, where the right-wing in Ecuador uh, betrayed the process in Ecuador, and we've now seen the arrival to the presidency of one of the most conservative leaders in Ecuador. He supported the coup d'etat in Bolivia, and Mauricio Macri in Argentina did exactly the same. He sent uh, military, he sent weapons days before the massacres in Bolivia, where a large amount of people died defending democracy, fighting against the coup d'etat. So it's not just through legal mechanisms or the media, but we're also seeing old school methods, such as the classic coup d'etat, rather, that our continent lived through many times in the 20th century with the Condor Plan in the 60s, 70s which was the name given to that first advance of coup d'etats in our continent. So with Lenin Moreno, what we saw was a second wave of the Condor Plan. And finally, how, do, how does Latin America find itself within this situation today? So what we're seeing is kind of a rebirth of these processes of a strong anti-neoliberal 
neoliberal struggle. So at the beginning of the 21st century, we saw great popular struggles against neoliberalism that affected the lives of the working classes, poverty, hunger, unemployment, lack of education, and people organized themselves to stand up against these neoliberal projects. So today, not just it's not just been 20 years, but 30, 40 years of neoliberalism in those countries that see themselves as the strongest, the most allied to the interests of the United States, which are those that are on the Pacific coast of our continent, Colombia, Peru, Chile, they are now in great process, in the midst of great process of transformation with clear anti-neoliberal characteristics. Obviously, they're not all the same, but they are, are all standing up against neoliberal ideals, like in Colombia, who are, where the people are standing up against the tax reform, in Peru, where we've finally seen uh, the arrival to the presidency, a, a rural teacher who no one had on their political map, and in the case of Chile, enormous demonstrations that managed not only to overthrow Pinochet's constitution, who was the dictator of Chile, uh, with uh, thanks to the coup d'etat against Salvador Allende in 1973, but they have also managed to get the promise to write a new constitution with a whole group of diverse people who were historically excluded from the legislative process, such as indigenous people, people on the left. And this gets us to ask whether this is a, an advance 2.0 or if it's a reactivated advance of uh, people who have always been against neoliberalism in those countries where this first stage of anti-neoliberalism didn't take place. For example, in, in Chile, Peru, Colombia, we didn't see these, this small wave of uh, government advances of more progressive socialist governments. And perhaps it's those peoples now who are standing up to make this movement. And finally, to close, just one thought that this movement in our continent leaves us is this intrinsic relation very intimate relationship that exists in Latin America that exists between the polls and the streets, between the voting process and the presentation of candidates, etc., so that they can reach certain positions and how that relates to the movement and feeling on the streets. How uh, all the, grand, the large scale movements that have happened in Latin America since 2018 2020, how these movements have been transformed into movements and demonstrations at the polls, as has been the case with Pedro Castillo. And these are not always necessarily linked to the presidency, but um, are linked to other legislative processes, like in Chile, for example. But what we are seeing in Latin America is that the way of guaranteeing that what is going on in the street is reflected in the polls is thanks to a large demonstrations of organized peoples. This was the case in Peru. Many of our Peruvian comrades, as I'm sure uh, Hector Beja will tell us, if, uh, if the fraud that was committed by the right-wing candidate hadn't taken place or hadn't been discussed more widely, this progressive movement probably wouldn't have gained so much momentum. And just to close, one question that is on the agenda is how imperialism is advancing again using old school methods and how do we counter these processes? how they finance different uh, governments under the table and how they try to show that the most radicalized and progressive processes in our continent are supposedly hell that will, uh, that will degrade human rights. They try to demonize these processes and 
as in the case of Cuba, how they try to destabilize the revolutionary process in order to be able to intervene themselves, to send, they send troops allegedly for humanitarian aid reasons. So what we're seeing now is a, def a defense of social processes of socialist movements in our continent. So that's why I was saying uh, Cuba, are, for example, are our big brothers that are opening doors to us. We, they thank, and we thank Cuba. And that is why today we are seeing clearly how the United States wants to make inroads on this revolutionary and socialist process that we have all come from. And what we're seeing is that imperialism does not pardon the socialist movements of our continent. What we, they, all they're trying to do is defend their own interests on our continent. So as, as has been said, they move forward, we move forward. And that's the situation we're in at the moment. Thank you, Hernan. Thank you very much, Laura. So, in a general manner, this, the situation in Latin America has enabled us to do certain uh, analyses, and I hope that Hector Beja from Peru is going to be able to connect soon. Hector Beja is a, a great academic and activist. And I hope he'll have a lot to say about what Laura says as well about the situation in Peru. So as we wait for him, I'm going to give the floor to our dear comrade in the panel, Javier Calderon. Javier Calderon is a doctoral candidate in social sciences at the University of Buenos Aires. He holds a master's degree in sociology and a bachelor's degree in sociology from the University of Columbia. He is also a researcher at the Institute of Latin American and Caribbean Studies, IEALC, and of UBA, and is a researcher at the Latin American Strategic Center for Geopolitics, the CLAG for its Spanish initials. So, as I said, what we have in common is the struggle to build a common political process. So after that, I will now pass the floor to our dear friend Javier from Colombia for him to tell us uh, what is going on in our Sicily Republic of Colombia. Welcome, Javier. Un saludo para todas y para todos desde los distintos lugares que nos están escuchando, que estamos aquí. Thank you, Hernan. Greetings for everyone, everyone who's connected here through this uh, virtual tools. I will be talking specifically about Colombia and probably establishing certain connections of the Colombian situations with the region. A few of these things Laura mentioned before me. The last 80 days, during the last 80 days, Colombia has been in an uprising. Everyone has heard that in Colombia, there's social social movement uh, right now of social organization and that is very discontent with the Colombian government, with the Colombian social structure. Through the media, we started seeing large demonstrations, uprisings, conflicts, clashes between the Colombian people and the police in the streets of the main Colombian cities. And a lot of people asked us, men, women from Colombia, where did this came from? Why is there such a social uprising right now? So I'd like to share about this, uh, a few comments to, to answer this very easy question about why Colombia is going through the uprisings we have seen in the last 80 days. So to answer this, first I'll say who are the people and the organizations who are mobilized, who are 
discontent and in the streets demonstrating against the Colombian government and against the violent, violent neoliberal structure that's in government, in power in this country. For decades, social organizations have been coming together in Colombia, resisting first and foremost, a certain form of implementation of capitalism in Colombia, a form of implementation of capitalism that was connected with the process of neo-colonization. The dominant classes in Colombia establish a strong synergy with the US to implement in Colombia, a model of restricted democracy, where only two parties, liberal and conservative parties, had the possibility to legally be in government. They reached an agreement, a constitutional reform in 1988, that expelled de facto an important part of the Colombian society who was then unable to be elected to participate in government or become public officials. This decision by the dominant class is together with, uh, made in conjunction with the US, produced the social reaction of excluded sectors from this democracy. And this expressed itself in the form of different kinds of organizations. Some were uh, farmers, uh, social organizations. Colombia, for those of you who don't know this, Colombia has a farming tradition that is very important. It has always been an indigenous farming country, very similar to Ecuador, Bolivia. The Andean world is a world of farmers, a world that enjoys working the land, producing their foods, and Colombia is no exception. Their production, their social organization is very strongly connected to this productive structure. So peasantry and indigenous and Afro-descendant organizations opposed very strongly this uh, restrictions on democracy and the imposition of an economic model that went against this agricultural production that I described just now. This also generated violence. The Colombian state began attacking this farmer sectors, this indigenous sectors, sectors of workers that were opposing the obstruction of democracy. In 1964, a war began in Colombia, a war in which the popular sectors, farmer sectors, took up arms against the National Front, which was this bipartisan organization. And since then, peasant organizations and social organizations, those who were uh, civilians, democratic, pacific, they continued growing and resisted, and other organizations decided to took up weapons and tried to overthrow the government through uh, violent means. 60 years later, guerrillas have started generating processes of peace with governments. The last one was in 2016. And this gave way to a huge social social movement where we can see some of these old organizations, some of these old social organizations from the 60s and 70s, also together with uh, youth movements, student movements, neighborhoods, and the few unions that neoliberalism hasn't destroyed. What we've seen in this, on the streets in the last 60, 80 days is on the first hand, the accumulated result of all of these struggles against neoliberalism, against capitalism, and against the obstruction of democracy, against colonialism and against war. I think and this is very important for me to say, it's a movement that after 60 years of internal armed conflict, 
in Colombia, we have a social movement of very of a very strong opposition to war, which doesn't mean that people and the society don't want social change anymore. So that one of the characteristics of the movement that we've seen in the last few days is first resilience. There are many victims to the internal of the internal armed conflict who are part of this movement for change in Colombia. This is a farmer, indigenous and student movements who have been gravely attacked. And here, let me just share a few numbers with you. In the last three years, 1,100 men and women leaders of social movements in Colombia have been assassinated. Former combatants of the insurgency were assassinated. One of the characteristics of the Colombian state is to use violence against social movements. These movements are organized in such a way, and they show First of all, that there is an exhaustion of society as a whole. There's a need for change, a need to transform social order, and certain challenges have been set. So what is it that these uh, mobilized organizations on the streets are saying? They're talking about leaving neoliberalism, a model that has for 40 years destroyed the structure, the economic structure of the country, a neoliberalism that's that has a lot of links with drug trafficking and the dominant class in Colombia has built a structure of coercion to uh, society on the basis of military forces. So the Colombian society is saying, we do not want this anymore. We want to leave neoliberalism behind where we find that the only thing the state offers is violence, wars, and military force for uh, violent coercion. The Colombian social movement has, and I think this is something that we should start mentioning, this social uprising has a very large element of spontaneous movement. As I, as I mentioned, we had certain organizations since the 60s, but there are also a lot of young people involved. This is a young movement and they need to organize. They need to survive and resist this state violence. In Colombia, what we're seeing is the birth of the movement for a different Colombia with this characteristics, very particular characteristic that Laura mentioned before. On the one hand, it's a movement that's on the streets, they're mobilized, they are expressing their discontent because they have no representation in, in the Congress. They have no representation in the political structure of the country. There is a huge crisis of uh, political crisis of representation. And that's why they've taken the streets as a way to do politics. This is part of the wave of changes and transformations in Latin America. One of the ways, one of the methods that Latin American people have found to transform or to bring about change. We see assemblies and cultural activities. There's a cultural transformation of Colombian society that we can see on the streets. And this goes hand in hand with another process that is very slow and has begun already a few years ago of a very diverse political organization that's today called Historical Pact. There we see a coming together of different forces. They are 
aiming at the elections in 2022. So, so, so that they can express the what we see on the streets and turn it into a government. The challenge today in Colombia is to put an end to war and open a horizon or a moment of reparation and resilience for the victims of an armed conflict that lasted so long, 60 years, to build social justice. This is a debt of Colombia. It's the most unequal country in Latin America after Haiti with a very uneven distribution of wealth and a very uneven distribution of poverty. This year, we have 21 million people in poverty and 7 million people who are in extreme poverty. This means that they only eat once or twice a day. So they do not reach their basic nutritional needs. This means we have the urgent need to build a government, to build a political alternative, to transform or to channel this social mobilization into significant changes when it comes to democracy and the restitution of rights of a society that has been losing rights after 40 years of neoliberalism and the imposition of a colonial violent capitalism that has turned Colombia into a country as everyone knows, a country that's marked by drug, drug trafficking, marked by violence and very closely linked to the foreign affairs or the foreign policy of the US, a country that even dares to attack their neighbors. In Colombia, was Colombia is where uh, one of the platforms to destabilize popular processes in Latin America was created. So we are talking about destabilizing Venezuela and Bolivia. This means then a change, a necessary change in the social order that needs to begin with the government. So the decision then of the popular sectors in Colombia is to build a new government through elections in electoral dispute and through this mechanism of unity called historical pact, pacto historico, and to strengthen social mobilization on the streets to prevent further for the erosion of rights. All of this in the context of a constant struggle from the dominant classes that continue repressing and try to stop mobilizations. We have had assassinations disappeared. And yet, despite this state violence against social movements, we still see huge mobilization and a, a lot of mobilization relating to this idea, this ideal of transforming Colombia. And finally, to sum up and to close, I believe Colombia has for many years been walking towards building a utopy and liberation from colonialism, from colonialism from the United States and towards building a participative democracy that's very different to the restrictive representative democracy that is today in crisis. A utopy that, as I said, has clashed with a huge conservative power with the support of the US and with a lot of violence. So this is a historical moment, even though perhaps the social uprising has only been visible in the last few weeks, Colombia has been building this alternative to neoliberalism for years, an alternative of peace and social justice that we hope can become effective or come into power in 2022 in the electoral struggle. And if it's not possible, then certainly the Colombian people will continue on the streets. They will continue working and building organizations and 
working on the at the grassroots level. There are hundreds of very interesting experiences that it would be really worth it to explain and get into, though sadly we don't have the time for this. Different alternatives to the financial drug trafficking model that was created in Colombia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Javier, for that overview. And this last comment that you made about looking into alternative processes that have been built so far. I think that even though it's a shame that we haven't had Hector Becher with us, and I believe he won't be joining us, this still opens for us the possibility of coming into a debate and dialogue with the people from the audience, being able to maybe, maybe make more comments. So we don't have Professor Hector here. So if you will allow me, I'll take the floor now to mention a few comments about the Venezuelan process there specifically. I'd like to share certain very general information. So talking about Venezuela, it's always very complex. The same goes for our continent. As Laura and Javier said before, the mainstream, the matrix of opinion at a global level is very often heavily disconnected and going against the grain of the popular processes from our continents, specifically those that are deeply connected with the grassroots levels and who those the processes that have an anti-imperialist position. So what we can see is processes in Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, Colombia, and Bolivia, they are under heavy censorship. So when we talk about Venezuela, mainly we talk about fighting against propaganda. So what we can see in the transnational media is propaganda against the Bolivarian revolution. And this is where I'd like to begin. I'd like to begin sharing some specific data that they can help us discuss this matrix of opinion that we see often in the media. They continue trying to state this idea of uh, the problems of democracy, the failure of a model, the violation of human rights, economic failure. And this is the idea that I'd like to speak against and to share a few elements so the problem in Venezuela is essentially geopolitical. The reasons behind the media attacks, as well as the specific situation in Venezuela, which is certainly a situation of crisis, this has its reasons in geopolitics. And more specifically, with the US, who had once full control of this region and in general, global control, the hegemony of North American imperialism worldwide, and more specifically, Latin America and Venezuela. So here I'd like to share my screen. Just give me one minute. I'd like to share a few images with you. I think here you might be able to see a few things in this image. So in the year 2000, Venezuela, the world's largest source of oil exported mainly to the US, to a certain degree, Canada, Cuba, Brazil, and to a lesser degree, other countries. But this, again, is in the year 2000. Just to share a few numbers. In the year 2000, Venezuela sold to the US, as we can see here, the US was the main buyer. Six uh, billion dollars, and that was about 86 tons of petrol for 16 billion dollars. Now I'd like to show you how after the 2000, and let's remember that it was in 1998 that the Bolivarian Revolution began. So we're at the very beginning of the revolution. So in 
2013, in this same map, we can see some very significant changes. We can see that there's still a large amount of oil being exported to the US, but we're also seeing that there's a large amount of oil being exported to China, India, Singapore, and of course, other countries on the continent, Europe as well. But previously, exports of oil went only to the United States, but now we're seeing that it's going to other countries, primarily Asia. So you're seeing how we're seeing how in 2013, 13 years after the numbers have changed. Now when they're not selling 80, 85 million tons like in 2000, but now that figure has been reduced to the United States to 45 million tons. That's just about half. It's still an important and large figure. Uh, we haven't stopped selling oil to the United States, but it's that amount is being sold at $31 billion. So you can verify these figures in the, in the United Nations uh, financial measurement system. So in 2000, 85 million tons were sold at $16 billion to the United States, while in 2013, half of that oil was sold at double the price, 61 billion. So that's where I'd like to begin. Uh, the current situation towards Venezuela is, is not based on the fact that, uh, well, it's been just over six years of the United States attacking and blockading Venezuela, but it has to do with the fact well, they're saying that they're worried about human rights violations in Venezuela. They're worried about the Venezuelan population. No, the problem of the United States has to do with the fact that 20 years ago, and during the second half of the 20th century, they had full access to our pet, uh, oil. And it, uh, Venezuela was the biggest oil country in the world. And, and 20 years ago, the United States had complete control over the oil in our country. Venezuela sold the vast majority of its oil at a low price to the United States. And at the same time, Venezuela was also part of the OAS. It was part of the Andean community of production. And it wasn't part of any integration processes. Venezuela was a country where its main reference in terms of reference point in terms of social and political terms was the United States. And in 2013, not only is Venezuela not selling all its oil to the United States, but furthermore, it's selling it at double the price as it was selling earlier. But also in 2013, Venezuela has started to promote an integration process of Latin America for all American states minus the United States and Canada, which is the CELAC. And this not for free trade, but for cooperation and development among Latin American countries. It's promoting an, a process of exchange and support, which is called the Petro Carid, which is to support imports of and exports of oil between American countries, which have, were pri primarily previously uh, colonial settlements of Europe and the United States. So this is an anti-imperialist process, which challenged the imperialist processes of the United States and promoted socialist ways of living. It, promoted socialist ways of living that were different to capitalist ways of living. So here, the United States saw that it was losing its global hegemony. It was losing what Venezuela offered it in terms of geopolitical and oil security. And Venezuela was setting out the need for a change in social models. Of course, 
uh, the rates of profit that it was getting from us was reduced dramatically in the 50s, 80s, the United States had an official uh, profit rate of around 18, 20% profit. In 2000, this rate of profit dropped significantly to between 4 and 9%. So, the main or the first idea to analyze is that this is the problem with Venezuela. The problem is that the United States policy towards Venezuela in 2000 to 2013, um, which was set out by Obama's administration, and which said that Venezuela was a threat to the United States. And this is a threat. It was a threat because previously it was uh, the United States backyard of oil uh, provision. And previously, the United States was able to control it to arm um, its own hegemony. But now Venezuela was moving towards a system, a multipolar system with cooperation between China, Asia, the Caribbean, which threatened the United States unipolar Yankee uh, domination. So these are the reasons why United States has changed its opinion towards Venezuela. That's the first idea I wanted to share. And the second idea I wanted to share, which I think is very important in terms of the Venezuelan model and shows where the problems come in terms of challenging Venezuela. What people have been discussing about Venezuela recently is the failure of socialism, but in fact, what we're really seeing is how socialism has worked in Venezuela. So I'm going to explain this better so that there's no problems with interpretation. Here, you can see these two columns, the red and the blue. These two columns represent, well, the blue column represents the tax, the accumulated tax income between 1977 and 1998 in Venezuela. So between 1977 and 1998 in Venezuela, $242 billion in tax revenue came into Venezuela. And that was on the basis of oil sales. And this percentage, uh, if you look at the red column, that represents the percentage of that income that was invested into social well-being. So the blue is the income and the red is the investment into well, social issues. So that was about 76%. So the columns that you can see towards on the right show Rather, that was 40%. And now if you look on the right, this shows the numbers for between 1999 and 2020. So you can see that between 2012, 2013, we started selling less oil to the United States, but at, at a higher price. So we managed to recuperate more money from that. So where we were losing a large part of that money to the United States, we started gaining a lot more back. Give me one second because Professor Bejar is writing to me now. Jade, perhaps you could send me a link to send it to Professor Bejar. He doesn't have a link to this meeting uh, so that he can register himself, please. So, sorry for the interruption. Yeah, okay, yeah. So, think. I'm showing you how Venezuela recovered part of the oil sales that it had lost to the United States and reincorporated it into social investment. So, from 40% investment, how it's increased between, from 1977 to 1998, how it increased between 1999 and 2020. But 
So at the same time, in this, as it recovered more money, the amount it was investing into social investment also almost doubled. So now, uh, between 1999 and 2020, 76.4% of tax income or tax revenues coming into Venezuela was being invested into social investment. So the majority of revenue coming into the country was being distributed among the population. So this is a key part. So just think, this is an element. This is one of the main lines of attack against Venezuela. They're attacking this model of distribution. This is a distribution model that among other things, and here I'd like to go on to the next idea, because this distribution model is that which was promoted by Chavism and the current social model in the last 20 years. And this, among other things, has allowed uh, that extreme poverty in Venezuela has been reduced from uh, 10, 11% in 1998 to around 4% today, illiteracy in Venezuela has been reduced to zero. 3.5 million houses have been built for the people. And these have been built by private com uh, imp companies and state bodies. 83% of schools in Venezuela are public. That means they are free and places are guaranteed for everybody in the population. In these, over these years, over, around 5 million people have been able to graduate from university. Unemployment in Venezuela has been reduced to around six, by six, 7%, in, even at, at times of the biggest crisis. There have been 52 increases in minimum wage with increased uh, national defense capacity. And for a long time, we've been at threat from the United States, both militarily and politically. So we have four, an army that's four million strong, five million students, receive uh, food support in schools. And I'm just showing, showing you how the distribution model has worked. And I think there are four important aspects here. Infrastructure and equipment local, that have been done on a local, regional, and national basis. Uh, this has been done through redistribution of income. With it's been done through uh, subsidies, pub through public services. In Venezuela, public services don't have the same cost as in other countries. Many are free and guaranteed for the majority of the population. Uh, in this time, we've managed to guarantee pensions for all workers at retirement age. They're all able to receive pensions from the state, but we have also implemented um, a, a subsidy system for, for families with the lowest resources of, and most vulnerable families with members of parents who have disabilities or other illnesses. And what I'd like to highlight is that a large amount of this money redistributed has been focused on subsidizing services, infrastructure, developing equipment and investing in pensions, but a part of this income has been redistributed to strengthening community organizations and to develop public policies. So this is where I'd like to focus. Recently, and I'd like to show you this graph here, as a result of the sanctions imposed against Venezuela, this oil income that we saw here that has given us this amount of income has been reduced. 
And in 2013, we had $46 billion coming into Venezuela. At its peak, we had $52 billion coming in. Now, the various banks have taken in uh, the Venezuelan currency and placed it under control of the Treasury Department. The oil industry has been completely devalued. Financial operations with Venezuela have been prohibited, and therefore the money capacity and the capacity to send remittances, etc., to Venezuela has been cut off. We're seeing a complete weakening of the public apparatus in Venezuela. And it, the operations of oil sales with other countries have also been uh, prohibited. So the boats that come to take uh, uh, Venezuelan oil to other countries have been have received sanctions as well. So these boats, these companies have had to develop new routes to stop these boats from being uh, being intervened with in the oceans and being subject to sanctions. So all of this has meant that from $52 billion, our income in 2020 was barely 744 million. You can see here clearly how sharp the fall has been. And this is, these figures are from the Venezuelan Central Bank, but these are also from private consulting companies. Even risk qualifiers and assessors such as Bloomberg. So you can see how uh, the income of oil income has dropped to Venezuela. Now, because of the US blockades and sanctions, it has been reduced to 1% of what it was. 1%. So that's to say that from 2012 to, to today, we have lost an amount of money that's rough, roughly the amount that it would take Venezuela to pay over 45 years, all the imports that it would need in terms of food, capital, medicines, even vaccines. And so that's where we come to the point where the fight against the pandemic has been even more difficult uh, in terms of subsistence. Uh, the last point I'd like to make has to do with how the situation in Venezuela can be seen as an expression or and how, uh, although other people are trying to show Venezuela as an ex example of the failure of socialism, despite all of these tragic circumstances, Venezuela has managed to stand still, stand strong. It's managed to continue redistributing income. And because of all this, this has enabled Venezuela to see that there are over 46 million Uh, people part of uh, who are part of community organizations and have been supported. I'd just like to mention a few uh, aspects and important elements of this. The first has to do with production. Certain organizations have been forced to develop new forms of production. So now they can't uh, access the same packages of seeds or agrotoxins, but now what they have to use indigenous seeds, use different forms of natural fer forms of fertilization. And this has created a whole source of community uh, development to so this is different to capitalist forms of production like Monsanto, we see with Monsanto, but what these community groups are doing are, is that they are able to produce on a scale where they are able to uh, support themselves and to share with other communities. And in, even in some cases, they're able to share their products with some other regions of the country. So 
although this production doesn't have the same scale, what is prioritized is uh, self-subsistence and sharing with other communities and regions. So we're seeing communal uh, productions, production systems. In Caracas, for example, we have we have solidarity uh, networks who have shown that organized communities can build distribution networks that don't have to go through uh, other large scale networks. So from 2015, when we, were, we saw the blockades imposed, Venezuela used its oil industry to be able to provide food and provide direct solutions to communities. So what we saw in these organized communities were local provision yes. communities which local committees dedicated themselves to providing food to fami families, families directly without any other intermediaries. So now 65% of families receive, food receive these subsidies. subsidies or grants. I'd also like to mention a few things about uh, service management or administrations. In most communities, as I said, aside from the fact that socialism has allowed it or made it possible for this to be sustainable for as long, they also proved to have the capacity to repair public roads, build schools, build health centers. This management capacity also made it possible that during situations of crisis, the distribution of fuel for the needs of each household was ensured. This also made it possible to sustain or to uh, keep working on the health centers in each communities. We also saw different uh, troops or groups of uh, cleaning and maintainment of different communities. We see this in different communes in different areas of the country. So basically what we're talking about is communities that have autonomous capacity for insurance services. Communities also have the capacity to repair collective infrastructure. So for a long time, the distribution of this income went into the uh, capacity building for communities to be able to ensure these different needs in terms of health, in terms of education. And it is this that made it possible for communities to be resilient in this difficult time. So this capacity is that now when the state doesn't have the enough resources, the community itself sometimes do what we call callapa. This is collective work in order to recover certain areas of the community that need to be repaired or reorganized. And it is so that certain operative aspects then are ensured. So this community tissue or, or webbing that was strengthened through this redistribution of income is what made it possible to progress into massive level of organizations in Venezuela, massive community organizing that makes it possible today to defend life, to defend self-defense against for example, as some uh, feminist organizations have said to be able to protect communities against femicide, against different types of violence. So in the middle of this catastrophe that we find ourselves in, as is the name of the South-South Forum, we see this also pronounced even or deepened even more during the pandemic but in Venezuela, it was possible to resist here thanks to the capacity of the community. And finally, I'd just like to say that this is not uh, a utopia. It's not a perfection. We are suffering under a blockade. And just as we can see, 
that in Venezuela, people are living in very difficult conditions, just as revolutionary Cuba, as a result of the blockade, the living conditions of the people are very difficult and we make huge efforts to ensure basic needs are met. And now with the pandemic, there are a lot of efforts made to try to contain the disease, reduce contagion, to have access to vaccine right now. Any vaccine that reached Cuba had to do, any vaccine that uh, reached Venezuela had to do with the support of China, of Cuba, of Russia. In the case of Venezuela, with a lot of effort, they paid into the COVAX medicine of the United Nations to be able to import a huge, uh, an important number of vaccine. And also this, this was also blocked by the US. So the COVAX mechanism announced recently that they would try to they would try to ensure this does happen, but so far it hasn't been the case. And finally, I wanted to mention that again, the reason for the crisis in Venezuela is the imperialist blockade. And the reason for this blockade is political. There is no human rights issue in Venezuela. It's an imperialist blockade. And this imperialist blockade is a mechanism of attack against the alternative mode of income distribution in Venezuela. And in the last few years, what we've seen in Venezuela is how we see a conflict between the different streams or trends or political trends between those who try to build socialism from community and those who want an income. And that's the battle. I'm sorry if someone could mute Hector Bejar's microphone, please. He's overcoming his the sound is not coming through. There we go. Thank you very much. What I'd like to invite you all uh, to do, part of what I just share with you, you can see this in the online webinar, Venezuela in Struggle. It's available in Alba TV YouTube channel. And there you can see how the process of community organizing in Venezuela is expressed and explained in different sessions from the protagonists themselves, from people who are in the commune, from social movements, from political organizations, and members of all of these entities themselves. So we believe that the community alternative, the community horizon is something that must be built. Also based on the perspective of struggle that we heard from different comrades before. The only perspective to overcome the crisis of capitalism is by building a socialist community, grassroots-based alternative. If we want to overcome poverty, we need to give power to the people. And I believe that the only way to ensure this is to go back to the idea of commune or nothing. It is in the commune that we can ensure distribution, plan, planning, and have the necessary means to ensure the reproduction of life. And it is only in this way that we will be able to talk about a communal state. We believe that this thesis needs to come together with the thesis of plurinational state that our comrades from Bolivia shared before. So with that, I'll close my presentation. Let me stop sharing screen for just a minute. I think we've finally managed to have our comrade Hector Bejar with us. So now we can give him the floor for the last presentation. Our dear Hector Bejar is joining us from Peru. So let me just as an introduction to share with you that Hector Bejar is a Peruvian sociologist. He is a lawyer and an expert in social policy. Currently, he is a doctoral candidate in sociology at the uh, major national university of San Marcos. He's saying, I'm already a doctor. All oh, right, so no longer a candidate. Yes, that's exactly it. He obtained his master's degree in management of social projects at the same university. UNSAM, and he got his degree in law and political science from the national 
major national university of San Marcos. He is also a very well respected and a very dear comrade in the struggle from Peru and Latin America. So thank you for being here and welcome. Thank you very much for the opportunity of being here for the space you opened for me and greetings to everyone. So I imagine you'd like to hear about Peru from me, isn't it so? Well, yes, maybe a little bit. All right. And how much time do I have? Let's say 15 minutes. All right. So let's do the best we can in 15 minutes. How can we explain the situation in Peru for it to be understandable for our neighbor countries in Latin America and other countries, other friends that are here with us right now? I'd like to say, first of all, that Peru this July 28th will be reaching its 200th anniversary of its Republican life, not its independent life, it's Republican life. Now, talking about Republican life in Peru sounds a bit like an exaggeration, because when we say Republic, we're talking about something related to the public. And right now, Peru is an entirely privatized country. We could say that Peru right now is a re private, not a republic. In these 200 years, however, there have been many struggles, huge, immense struggles involving intellectuals during the entire 19th century, involving indigenous organization, unions. We've had first the War of Independence that came to an end with Bolivar, Bolivar the Venezuelan, in 1824 which was also supported by a very interesting struggle from the peoples in Peru. And before that, as an antecedent, we had a lot of indigenous struggle. The most important from this was the uprising of Tupac Amaru and Tupac Katari, which involved the main uh, large areas of Peru and Bolivia territory, which sadly ended with the torture and the terrible crimes of Spanish invaders against the entire clan and family of Tupac Amaru and Tupac Katari and their supporters. But very well, history went on and during the entire 19th century, the indigenous people, as we in Peru say, the Indians, most of them continued uprising. Most of them are forgotten by history. Others, yes, have are still remembered more or less in conventional history. And now we remember them by their leaders. Their great names, or the great names among them are, for example, Sanchez Carrion, who worked together with Bolivar, because Bolivar dealt with war in Bolivia. And as a president, Sanchez Carrion organized, together with Bolivia, Bolivar, the first conference in Panama, a first attempt to bring together the first call to unity of the peoples of our continent against the United States. This was in 1826 in Panama. This was an effort of Sanchez Carrillo and Bolivar together. So in the birth of the Peruvian Republic, we find there a Venezuelan, an immortal Venezuelan, such as Bolivar, and an immortal Peruvian, as Sanchez Carrillo. After that, we have the struggles against slavery and the abolition of slavery, which was accomplished in 1884. There we should remember Pedro and Jose Galvez, brothers, liberal brothers, and the 
the true liberalism, not this new neoliberalism, because the liberalism of the 19th century was the left of the 19th century. They defended indigenous people, slaves, and Manuelo González Prada uh, celebrated figure in Peruvian history, the first to defend indigenous people and the country in at the end of the 19th century. We also have, of course, the streams of anarchism and socialism that suddenly you must all be aware of the legacy of Jose Carlos Mariategui. But that's just the antecessors of what I want to share with you. What I want to share with you is that despite all of this and despite everything that the Peruvian people achieved from the grassroots levels through their struggles that costed so much blood and pain and effort, we've also had a large silent crowd hidden under the outlook of a conventional country. It's the citizenship of Peru. Citizens for Peru, but not for the Republic. In Peru, we have what Jorge Basadre, our official historian, calls the deep Peru. The Peru from the Andes, from the Amazon jungle, from the mountains of Lima, and areas such as Trujillo or Chiclayo in the desert. And suddenly, to the surprise of everyone, myself included, in this election process, they decided to vote one of them, one of their own. Everything we've had in Peru was the defense that came from the outside. Those who defended the indigenous people weren't indigenous people themselves. The ones involved in the fight, of course, were the indigenous people, but they couldn't speak in their own language because they couldn't, they wouldn't be understood. Quechua, the language, which is still a language spoken by most of the people from Peru, wasn't an official language up until the times of Velasco, who made it official in 1968, 1970. But despite being an official language, despite the fact that our national TV and radio has a few programs in Quechua, it's still a language considered as second level or even a silent language in the real Peru. And I think that what happened here in the first and second round of elections, of last elections, is that a significant amount of people from Peru decided to vote one of their own. We're talking about one third of Peru's population. Peru has about, we have a population of 32 million people of which 24 million are voters. From this 24 million, only 16 million turned in their ballot, ballots, and from these only 9 million voted for someone who was unknown, a professor from a faraway rural school, one of those schools where each teacher is responsible for several uh, levels or years at the same time. So in the so in the same at the same time they need to teach four or five different levels, different children who are in these five different levels, and these teachers, who we call uh multi-degree or multi-level teachers many of them there are many of them one of them pedro castillo very surprisingly or very suddenly 
after his speech in the debate in the first round, which could not have been more than a few minutes, after having visited, visited every town, he managed people to understand him. And especially in the south of the country, he managed to accomplish a true uprising against the electoral system of the country and the system of political parties that had been imposed for many years with the support of the media that this our reprivate had. Now, this man who had not been officially recognized yet due to the actions of political actors and parties and media, they all oppose his uh, recognition and we hope legality can finally overcome in the next four days, probably in the next few hours, he will finally be acknowledged as president-elect of Peru. And after 200 years, and if we add to this 200 years, the 300 years of coloniality, so that means after 500 years, it is just now that a real member of the people will enter the presidential palace. This is a historical event. It is an immense historical event that we have the honor of experiencing ourselves. Despite the fact that this government might be weak or not, it might be successful or not, it will certainly be under attack and just as we can see already, it will be heavily under attack by all of the enemies that we already know. Regardless any of this, this is a great victory, a triumph of Peru, of all of Peru, not only that third of the people that voted for him, but of everyone. It's a historic triumph. We can see now a glimpse of a Peru in which the Republic starts existing. So that's what I wanted to share with you. And I'd like you to please join us in this celebration. It will be a celebration, one of the first times where Peru can look in the mirror and see themselves, just as our brothers uh, from Bolivia already saw themselves in the mirrors and acknowledged themselves as a plurinational state. And just as Venezuela is understanding itself as a state of communal based governments and as other brothers in America are struggling for their independence, we see here the beginning of a new stage in the struggle for the independence of our countries. Thank you very much.